Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Mr. Roshan. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. It's so nice uh, to to uh, see you all together. Uh, it in, in indeed a pleasure and something that we look forward every week uh, to to fellowship with you all. And sometimes we are able to do the entire service. Sometimes we have some responsibilities in our local church and we join late. But then we get to do the post service fellowship. So we are glad and we thank God about it. So allow me to uh, share my screen and then I'll start my message. One second. Hey, so one second, perfect. So uh, before I start, a bit of announcement. Today uh, we would be having communion. Uh, after my message, I would invite uh, Pastor Pastor Dan Zachariah to lead in communion. So please uh, keep your communion elements ready. And as we go into the message, join me as I pray. Hallelujah. Our Father and our Lord, we come before you boldly as we approach your throne of grace and mercy through the finished work of Christ and with the help of Holy Spirit. Indeed, it is a joy to fellowship and to experience your presence, your grace, your mercy in every aspect of our life. We want to thank you for this time of fellowship. As I bring your word to your people, Lord, I pray that you work in each and every individual heart. May that word be transformed and converted to the need of that person. And Lord, let your Holy Spirit touch and transform their lives. Be with us, Lord. I want to thank you and bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you would have noticed that uh, Roshan read exactly the same scriptures that David has uh, read in a previous, uh, when I led my previous message. Because my today's message is a continuation from my last message. Last time I talked about how faith plays a crucial role in believing and depending on God's word. I also talk about how often we lack faith to hang on to God's word. When we don't see his presence in our life when we don't see his presence in our circumstances or in our problems. Now, let me refer you back again to uh, the portion of the scripture reading and I'll directly jump to verse 24. And when he heard, this is the boy's father, when he heard this, the boy's father cried out with tears saying, I do believe, Lord, help my little faith. Help my little faith. And we also read in Luke chapter 17 verse 5 where the disciples also ask Jesus, increase our faith. Is it not our prayers as well to increase our faith? Well, today I want to talk about how we can increase our faith by understanding the various stages of faith by understanding the various stages of faith. Now, my, fa my message is, has excerpts from and statements from the book called The Critical Journey, The Stages in the Life of Faith by Janet O. Hagberg and Robert A. Ulick. The authors talk about how we can increase our faith through these stages. Now, the critical journey at its core is a description of our spiritual journey, our response to our faith in God with the resulting changes that follows in our life. The author talks about six stages of faith that we go through. But before we jump into these six stages to understand more about it, let's take a detour, detour and dig a little deeper on what is faith? What is faith? Now, faith is the substantiation of things hoped for. Hence, it is the assurance 
the confidence the confirmation the reality the foundation that supports the things we hope for now faith is also the conviction of things not seen it convicts us of things that we do not see hence it is the evidence the proof of things not seen but where does faith come from now the first thing we must understand is that faith does not originate from within us it does not we are not born with a natural ability to believe if we try to master a faith by our own will power we'll be discouraged this is because we are not the source of faith faith comes from god god gives us faith as we see in second peter chapter 1 verses 1 he allots the faith equally in his righteousness now god is not only the giver of faith he is also the author the originator of our faith as it says in hebrews chapter 12 verses 2 and we need faith to know god and to draw near to him as it says in hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 and without faith it is impossible to please god impossible to so to summarize faith is a medium or a bond between us and god faith helps us to know god and willfully allows us to respond to him in submission to invite him to work in us and to depend on him and to believe in him faith plays a pivotal role in our walk of life with god this life is a life of discipleship now discipleship is a lifelong journey and it's not a one time event now as the holy spirit guides us into a deeper understanding of who, who god is the development of our faith often follows through similar stages as the author here talks about the stages of faith there are times where we tear down the mistaken beliefs about god about ourselves as well as times where we build an experience deeper encounter with father son and the spirit now understanding the hallmarks and challenges of these faith stages can help us to walk alongside and encourage our other believers in grace and truth now these stages of faith can also be helpful tool in identifying the challenges and belief about god that members of our either bible study cell group or church are working through so now what are these stages ah well the six stages of faith are the first stage is called as powerlessness recognition of god this is where we recognize god's presence stage 2 is power by association this is where our life of discipleship starts stage 3 is the productive life this is where we use our gifts and talents to serve god we take joy in serving him and then we reach or we get stuck to the stage called the wall and that i would talk in detail about it the fourth stage the fourth stage is called as power by reflection the inward journey that when we pass through the wall we go through a inward journey followed by stage 5 the journey outward which leads us into a stage 6 called as the life of love now as we go through each of these stage we'll go through understanding its characteristics how we can get stuck in these stages and how god lead us forward from one stage to another but because of the time i would be covering the three stages today and we'll see the remaining three stages along with the wall in the next sunday yep 
Now, before we jump into our stage one, I wanted to take you to the stage zero, and that is a usual ordinary life. Now, this stage is about our everyday life we have before we have encounter with Jesus. A life in this stage is often defined by the parameters that is set by the society. And that is here either you are well to do, which is successful or you are struggling failures by the parameters defined by the society. Now, let me give you some examples. If you are a child going to school, the successful or well to do things defined by which school you go, what bag, what school bag you use, what equipments do you use. If you do that, they say, oh, wow, he is well to do from a well to do family. The moment you grow a little bit older, then it is how much marks you have got, which college you are going, how many Instagram followers you are. Now, suddenly the parameters that were there when you were a kid are different now when you are growing up. When you get a job, oh, which company you are, I am into multinational company, I am into this, what is your salary, what car you are, things keep different. And when you are successful in each stage, this society defines us as, oh, we are well to do. You are perfect. But imagine at every point of time, our parameters are changing. We are always struggling, always struggling to, to meet the parameters that is set by our society. And similarly, we are not winners if you fail to meet any one of them. And according to our society, we are failure, we have no hope. And now the second aspect of our everyday life is that it never, it never allows us to overcome our past, like our mistakes, our failures, our sins. They continue to haunt our present as a dead weight and continue to destroy our present and our future. There's no real forgiveness and restoration in this world. Now, whichever bracket you fall into, there is no assurance of hope as the parameter keeps changing. Until you die, this society's parameter keeps on changing. We don't have real sense of hope. And in that stage of our messy life, when God enters into our life, we move into stage one, which is called as the recognition of God. This is the stage where we believe. This is the stage where we began to see and feel the presence of God in our life. God reveals himself through his Holy Spirit to us. Now, as it says in John chapter 6, verse 44, the only way people come to me is by the Father who sent me. He pulls, up, pulls on their heart to embrace me. In this stage, we realize that we are loved. We are forgiven of our sins and our past, and we have a purpose and a future. We come to realization that our life is not a waste and worthiness. It's not worthless. Our, phys our current physical circumstances do not dictate our eternal future set by our God. We have a purpose. And in this stage, we start to believe. So what are the what, what are the characteristics of uh, uh, this stage? We, we start to, we suddenly have a greater meaning to things that we do around us. We start correlating things. We start to relate everything around us with the presence of God in our life. Now suddenly the nature makes sense. Why and how suddenly start making sense because of the presence of God in our life. It's an amazing place. But there is a danger in this stage. Is we often get stuck. Now how we get stuck? If you are drawn back to your sense of worthlessness or ignorance, or you don't believe that you are really loved, you often have a, a chances that you can get stuck. If you, if you allow yourself to pull back into the realities of life and this society where it says you are a failure, you are worthless, then we often, even after God touching you, there is a chances that you will get stuck 
because you let the realities of the world uh, overcome the world of God, that touch of God. But there's a hope. And how God leads us forward is, now one way to grow in this stage is to connect with other believers and start fellowship with them through the Bible study. You want to get over with your with, with, with the realities of how the society define you, that you're worthless, you're a failure, you have nothing to hope for, your, your past is drawing you back. Meet other believers, start fellowship with them. See how the testimony of their life is, 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 is showing you how beautiful it is to believe in God, to work with God. See, hear their testimonies. Let them inspire you. Let them give you strength. Let God work in your life through them. Start participating in the ministry to search what gifts and talents he has given so that you start having better relationship with God. Now we need to remain active and connected in order to progress from this stage. And when we do that, we move to a next stage. And the next stage here is we start to believe in this stage. And the next stage is, one minute, okay. Power by association. Power by association. Now in this stage, we are learning about God. In this stage, we get closer to God. We start to develop personal relationship with Him through prayers, through Bible study, through, through, through fellowship. In this phase, we are learning and absorbing the fundamentals of doctrines and practices of Christian life. God reveals Himself, His nature through his creation, his written and living word, word, he reveals us. When we read the Bible, he reveals himself through his written, through his Holy Spirit. And we start experience his presence in our life. What happens when we do that? We slowly start responding by submitting and depending on our decisions unto him. We start depending on him. We slowly start submission of our life's problem, major decisions, everything. And that's a process. We start to experience His grace and mercy in everything we do. In everything we do. As David says in Psalm 16 verse 11, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is a fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Our faith starts to grow in this stage. We come to a realization that we have a unique role to play in this relationship. We see our gifts and talents can be used to minister unto Him by contributing our time and efforts to doing church work, to do ministries, to help others, to help our neighbors. Right? Because it says in Ephesians chapter 2, God has created us for a purpose. And he has good purpose for us. Now, this is an amazing stage where God keeps revealing himself to us through his Holy Spirit. And the more and more we experience his love and his presence in our life, people around us start seeing that positive difference in us. And how they see? In a way we treat them. In a way we converse with them. In a way we take care of them. Because when you receive God's love, it is impossible for you to get a pure love and show a very different love around you. It is seen in your action, in a way you deal with people. What are the characteristics of uh, uh, this stage? Meaning comes from belonging. Here, you start fellowshipping with a greater body. And the meaning comes with a fellowship group. And as you fellowship with people, the sense of righteousness and security comes in our faith. Because you study with them, you do ministry with them, you do everything with them. And that's how you know that you are in this stage. But there are certain dangers. 
in this transformation process we are not yet spiritually matured to understand and implement the knowledge god is revealing us and so with our limited knowledge and understanding we have a limited view and with that limited view we start viewing people with that limited lens and often we end up comparing and criticizing them oh you don't fast oh your fasting is only one day oh you don't look at west when you pray these are the dangers because as god is giving us knowledge we still have not reached that maturity so often with our limited knowledge we start seeing the people we start comparing with them we start criticizing them we start telling them oh this is wrong that happens that is the danger of this stage now how do we move forward from this stage is that first is that we recognize our uniqueness and identify our giftedness god is revealing what talents and gifts he has given us right now our focus here instead of comparing and criticizing should be on learning how this is transforming and changing us in a, and how unique we are in god's eyes and the gift that he has showered upon us so recognition realization and using it the second part is when you recognize and you have a realization of god gifts god has given you you start to contribute it how you contribute it in 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 your church in your various activities that you do you start growing you start using your gift and god start revealing more and more god will give you strength in the areas he wants you to contribute and that is how you are led to another stage so this is the stage where we are in the process of transformation and when we lead into another stage the stage 3 is called as the productive life this is about doing things for god this phase is all about serving through your gifts and talents in the ministry taking joy in serving taking responsibilities in your cell group in your church receiving recognition here we have a sense of belonging in this stage my church my ministry my community my role and then you stroll start contributing and these are nothing but the characteristics of this stage now our gifts our talents are not something that we are we, we have developed on ourselves the holy spirit gives each one of us different gifts and talents for the glory of god as it says in first corinthians chapter 12 verse 4 to 11 and just read a, a portion of it now there are varieties of gifts but the same spirit and there are varieties of service but the same lord and there are varieties of activities but it is the same god who empowers them all in everyone to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good and i would encourage you to read the entire uh, verse 4 till verse 11 i want to end up that verse with saying with the verse 11 and it says all these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills what does that mean that means each one of us have got gifts and talents god has given us for the purpose that he know to bring glory to him so we should not compare oh he is good in leading but you are good in serving oh he is good in serving but you are good in praying oh he is good in praying but you are good in taking care we need to understand that god has given our gift and our talent which is unique to us stop comparing now the book critical theory states that about 85% of the christians are in this stage of faith if you take a moment and analyze your faith life you'll come to an conclusion that you are also in this stage 3 that is the life of discipleship now our faith grows exponentially in this stage as we take joy in serving him with our gifts and talents and with our time 
we also see a growth in our faith the growth in our spiritual life the growth in our walk with god we also experience material blessings like promotion of what we used to do in our churches from from one things the pastor says okay now you'll do greater things you see the promotion in your workplaces because you are showing god's love you are showing the integrity god's character in your work and you see the blessing of it this is a very good uh, stage but then again there are dangers of how can we get stuck in these in this stage and there are two main dangers a ministry often becomes action oriented now what means action oriented let me tell you let me give you my example i am good in service leading what anna did so i take it for granted i do it over week and week and week and slowly i stop getting the joy of leading the service for the lord it is just a repetition oh i need to say good morning everyone now this session will be led by this this session led by oh we thank you and i have a perfect words because i have repeated repeated in my mind but it is merely become action oriented what happen the more and more time you spend on to the uh, on on to doing the the ministry works slowly your personal time of devotion your personal relationship with people you start giving less time and this is a stage where you reach burnout serving doesn't bring you satisfaction we do as if we have to do it and let's just get through it and that's a danger that's a danger and the second danger is our ministry can become self centered and can end up being in performance now how it can end up being in performance you start doing oh i lead the service best so that means anna doesn't lead so well oh she could have stopped there oh she could have led there you now you start criticizing suddenly your humility in serving has become ego you know you're bringing your ego you're criticizing other ministries you're criticizing their approaches and that is where you can get stuck but god is not leaving us on our own self to move from one stage to another how does he lead to uh, take us forward now here what happens is sometime when we do the routine things it doesn't give us joy and excitement and satisfaction in serving we start to feel burnout and somehow we feel serving is like a routine thing and we start praying and we start asking god god what is next for me what do you want me to do where do you want me to grow my gifts and talents from this level to forward you start looking you start question you start asking god and you start you and you start to wait for him as he guides you that's one way of leading you forward the second way is that we ex- sometime we experience crisis either in our personal life or in our walk of faith we are taken back by a shock when we come across a loss which we cannot comprehend and the first thing it happens is i do everything for the god yet i have a medical problem yet i i i i lost somebody yet i something everything every time i do good thing but yet i am having a problem and that is where we start questioning god you start questioning god's presence in your life you start questioning god's abilities to come to your rescue and this is the stage where the relapse in the walk of faith can happen and it can have serious consequences what can happen you can relapse back into the stage 1 and right now back into stage 0 because of this problem and according to the authors of this book when things like this happen we move into the stage called the wall which i'll be talking next week in detail the wall is a invisible barrier that keeps us from growing deeper and more meaningful in our christian life 
and according to this author more than 80% of the Christian never pass through this wall. Many people don't realize that there is anything beyond this level to have a further deepening meaning of our Christian life. And I'll talk about more on the wall and the remaining three phases in my next Sunday message. Let me summarize what we talked today. But before that, this is an action oriented. I think I put the first slides to the end of my stage slide. So that's where the confusion is coming from. Okay, so let's summarize. We have seen what is faith. Faith is the substantiation of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen. We have seen God is the giver, the author and the originator of our faith. We have seen without faith, it is impossible to have relationship with God. We have seen the three stages of faith. The first stage is we have a purpose and we are loved. Second phase, we have a relationship with the living God. And the third stage is the productive life. We have given gifts and talents to do good works for him, for his glory. Now, let me assure you something. Whichever stage of faith you are in, God still loves us just as we are and where we are. God will continue to love us and we would continue to express, experience his grace. His love and grace does not depend on which stage of faith we are. He is not going to abandon us if we do not move to the last stage of faith. Our salvation is still secured in Jesus. No, spiritual growth is not about trying to meet some moral sense of, some sense of moral ob obligation, but about falling in deeper and deeper love with God. And because we have received such unconditional love and grace from him, we are compelled to do better version of ourselves every day. We are compelled every day to grow stronger and have a deeper relationship with him. Just like we see the love of prodigal son, when he sees his father's open arm welcoming him, forgetting him of his all wrongdoing, he knew he is forgiven. He knew, he knew he is loved and he knew his future is secured in his father's arm. Now we can never match God's love in loving him back and loving the people around us. We'll always fall short and this is why we need a Messiah like Jesus who continuously intercedes for us and through him we can love God and love others the way God loves us. It is Jesus' desire for us to grow in faith, in unity, unity, and be in one accord with each other, and in one accord with him as he is with his father. And this is his prayer in John 17. And I read it as I conclude my message, John chapter 17, verse 21 to 24. And Jesus says, I pray for all them all to be joined together as one even as you and i father you and i father are joined together as one i pray for them to become one with us so that the world will recognize that you have sent me for the very glory you have given to me i have given them so that they will be joined together as one and experience the same unity that we enjoy. You live fully in me and I now I live fully in them so that they will experience perfect unity. And the world will be convinced that you have sent me for they will see that you loved each one of them with the same passionate love you have for me. Father, I ask that you will allow everyone that you have given to me to be with me where I am. Then they will see my full glory, the very splendor you have placed upon me because you have loved me even before the beginning of time. And I now hand over the session to our Pastor Dan Zachariah as he leads us into communion.
Yeah. Dear brethren, <clears throat> as we now come to the table of the Lord and partake of the communion, I'd like to once again revisit the verse that was read to us by Sachin, uh, the prayer of Jesus. And even as we have uh, been led to understand through the message that God prepared through Sachin for us, we are constantly being led into a deeper relationship with God. Even as we go through those stages, we are beginning to see how God is leading us from one stage to another, where our faith grows and is seen in action. And it is all growing to one of those most beautiful aspects of the Christian life, unity. And this is where I'd like you to once again listen to the prayer of Jesus in the book of John, Gospel of John, chapter 17. I'll read just uh, three verses from verse 20 onwards, where Jesus says, I, in verse 20, he says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Isn't that heartening to know that Jesus is also praying for us. He has us in mind as he is communing with God the Father in the Holy Spirit. In verse 21, he says, May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. Uh, very powerful words, very meaningful words. Notice it says, as Jesus prays for us, he's praying for oneness in us. He's praying for that sense of unity and togetherness in us. And what kind of unity is he praying for? What kind of oneness? And this for lack of a better word, it's mind-blowing where Jesus is saying that he wants the same unity that they experience, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a similar oneness that they experience uh, as God. He wants that same oneness in us. And then I'd like you to also notice that when we grow through these stages into this oneness. He says, uh, uh, he, he also says, the, so that the world may believe you sent me. You know, the world will believe when they see the oneness. Uh, because the world does not know about this oneness. The world has never seen a oneness like this. But Jesus wants the world to see it in the church. He wants us to see it in his disciples. And when they see that, they will believe. That is the words of Jesus. It is the most Powerful evangelism, you could say. The oneness and the love that we experience amongst us and showcase it to the world, that is the most powerful evangelistic uh, action for the world to believe. And so, all of this made possible in Jesus our Lord. And so, brethren, as we come to the table and we recognize Jesus, even as we have been told we need a Messiah like Jesus, 
We don't need a Messiah with a sword and coming on a horse and conquering the world. But we need a Messiah who shows and manifests the love of God, which then he begins to develop in us. And that is where we understand faith is not from us, but from Jesus Christ our Lord. If you have your elements, bring them together. Let me pray and ask a blessing on the elements. And let us then partake of the elements together. Join me as I pray. Gracious Lord, thank you so much that you have shown what kind of love you, the Father, and the Holy Spirit have. And how 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 wonderful it is to know that it is that oneness you want to give to us where indeed we can experience that sense of unity and a relationship that is that the world has never seen and may we have that oneness in Jesus so that Lord the world will see and believe we indeed are the light of this world and the light we are sharing in this world is the light of Jesus. The love that he has shown for each one of us through his shed blood, through his sacrifice, and wonderfully through his resurrection. Today we commemorate, we showcase, we uh, manifest that sacrifice through partaking of the communion, Lord, and as we partake of the bread, we ask your blessings upon it, that we may recognize how Jesus went to the cross and allowed his body to be broken so that we might find healing, not just in a physical way, but spiritually, psychologically, mentally, relationally. And as we partake of the wine, symbolic of the blood of Jesus shed for us, let it bring cleansing. Let it take away all the brokenness in us, the sinfulness in us, so that, Father, we are restored to a sense of wholeness, so that we might experience that unity amongst us as brothers and sisters and with you as our father, as our elder brother, and as our comfort of the Holy Spirit. And so bless these elements that all of us have before us. And as we partake, Lord, grant us that you may bring restoration in us, even as we sang about it and spoke about it, and we seen the miracle of Jesus, bring that sense of restoration in us. So that, Lord, no matter what in our will, we will decide to be one. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity and this privilege to share in your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And brethren, as you take your piece of bread, as you partake of the body of Jesus Christ, our Lord, may you experience a sense of freedom from the brokenness we have. As you take your wine, may the shed blood of Jesus take away the sinfulness that has dogged our life and may it bring a sense of oneness within us as brothers and sisters and with our loving God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus Christ. And now may we live our lives to allow the love of Jesus to be manifest in us through the faith that we have, that he gives us, that we may be one, even as Jesus is one with the Father and the Spirit. God bless you all.